the last session, we have two, two great speakers. We're going from modelling to kind of the real world. I think that's the shift we've made over lunchtime. And I guess there's been a lot of interesting discussions uh, during lunch as well, some around what we can do as a community. And, and we might explore that when we finish the final talk, have a, a, a little bit of a summary of what we've heard today, and then perhaps think about what action we could take, and if you've got any questions about that as well. So our first speaker this afternoon, uh, Greg Lafoe, is a, a senior research scientist with the Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Actions, Agriculture, Victoria Research Division, which is based at the Agri Bio Centre in Bandura. Greg's got more than 25 years' experience in the biological control of weeds and pest insects. He leads research into the biological control of the weed silverleaf nightshade and biological control of horticultural pests as well. Past research projects include work on gauze, invasive brooms, bridal creeper and wandering trad. Greg's work covers a full range of classical biological control activities, including overseas exploration, field studies of new biocontrol agents, which we've had uh, alluded to some that weren't successful this morning, uh, risk ex assessment, quarantine experiments, release of approved agents, and dealing with stakeholders like farmers, public land management com uh, managers, and community-based natural resource management groups, integrated pest and weed management, and long-term impact assessment studies, which of course are, are critical for all this work we've talked about today. These are long-term things that we're gonna to have to put a lot of effort into. So with that, Greg, welcome. Thanks, Tim. And apologies again for the long bio, but to be fair, half of it was their new department name, so that's fair enough. <laughs> Okay, so I'll be talking about biocontrol of widespread weeds and I'll be, um, I'll make it focused on the Victorian situation in particular, but we do operate an, under a national system and it's important to recognise that um, there are really strict processes about the introduction of biocontrol agents in Australia and I'll touch on some of the research that we do to demonstrate how we um, address risk assessment, but then also the on-ground actions that community groups assist us with. So quite simply, weed biocontrol is a method of weed control that uses specialised natural enemies. Uh, the focus is on specialised, and I'll come back to that, especially insects, mites and fungi, and we call them biocontrol agents generally. That's a nice moth-eaten gorse in Tasmania that we're hoping, hoping to replicate in Victoria as well. So the benefits of biocontrol are firstly that it's environmentally friendly. So successful biocontrol programs can vastly reduce the uh, reliance on chemical controls and other control methods um, and because we're dealing with specialised biocontrol agents we're aiming to introduce biocontrol agents that only attack the target weed and don't harm non-target species. They're self-dispersing, um, much like uh, gene drive that we we're talking about, so once released they will spread in the environment and do their thing year after year. There are long-term solutions that are definitely not a quick fix and overall they're cost effective. So in Australia, the average um, uh, benefit cost ratio is around $23 to every $1 invested. So it's a really good return on investment for weed management. And in Victoria, um, weed biocontrol is based within Agriculture Victoria, which is part of DECA. Um, but we work really closely with other related government agencies such as Parks Victoria. Um, governments and industry invest in R&D to find safe and effective biocontrol agents. So, for example, uh, Meat and Livestock Australia will co-invest to look for biocontrol agents for grazing weeds and so on. Um, and we develop biocontrol agents that farmers, public land managers and community groups can use as part of integrated weed management. So once the initial research investment is done and we get biocontrol agents out of quarantine and into the field, it becomes a, a, a virtually a free tool that um, weed managers can use as part of integrated programs. In Victoria, the research is primarily conducted at the Agribio facility, which is on the La Trobe Uni campus out at Bandura, but we also work with our regional centres such as Datura, where we mass re agents for local releases. And we often consider biocontrol as a pipeline. So at the very beginning, we're looking at the ecology of the weed in Australia in its native range, um, in other introduced ranges. And we're, we're deciding whether 
by control is an option um, and whether we assist management outcomes. We do native range surveys and studies and I'll touch on those shortly. So we look at what's happening in the native range. What are the useful uh, herbivores that help to um, suppress populations in the native range? Um, are they efficacious and are they host specific? So do they attack other things? Um, and then we conduct a, a risk assessment of the most promising biocontrol agents and that's a critical part of the work that we do at AgriBio. And then once we get to the end of the pipeline and we get biocontrol agents approved and out into the field, um, we go through a process of bulking up the numbers for mass releases. We conduct those releases, we monitor and, and measure establishment and impact, but we always work really closely with the on-ground groups. So there are some uh, examples of the native range studies that we use. So that's um, Jackie Steele, who's in the audience and welcomes questions afterwards. Um, <laughs> Jackie is in the bayou listening to the soundtrack from Deliverance, no doubt. And she's um, looking for um, insects that attack Sagittaria in its native range in Texas. And she's also collecting little white grubs from surrounding plants. And so all little white grubs look the same. So Jackie's been using DNA extraction to see you know, does insect A only occur on plant A and so on? And so she's looking for those really host-specific biocontrol agents. And that's me with my Texas cowboy hat doing some native range studies where obviously with new biocontrol agents, we can't test them out in the field in Australia, so we can go to the native range. And in that field study, I was looking at um, uh, an insect that feeds on silverleaf nightshade and planting eggplants alongside the silverleaf nightshade to see if there's off-target damage on that crop species. And Alejandro and uh, Mariel are collaborators in Argentina who are doing those basic um, faunal surveys for us. So surveying silverleaf nightshade across a large part of Argentina, looking for prospective new biocontrol agents that we can feed into that pipeline. We do uh, quarantine testing to answer some really fundamental questions. So for example, in those tests, we're doing no choice experiments and they're also called starvation experiments. It's when you put an insect on a, a non-target species and measure whether it can actually feed on that plant or not. So it's a really conservative test. If it can't feed or lay eggs on that plant, um, then we consider that a very low risk. And we might move on to other experiments, um, especially for, more, um, for higher risk non-target species. Um, we often combine quarantine testing with the native range studies and other forms of evidence to build a risk assessment. Um, a byproduct of our biocontrol research is a vastly improved knowledge of some of our native species as well, and it's kind of not intuitive, but if you take the uh, silver leaf nightshade biocontrol program, there are many more than 100 native Solanum species, so they belong in the same genus. And we do need to test some of those really important species. So we test about um, 40 native Solanum species, so uh, we work out which are the most closely related, so we use phylogenies. Um, which occur in the same geographic range and so on. And so we select species that we will test. We then have to collect them and grow them and test them in the quarantine lab on the imported biocontrol agent. And this is where we really need to um, tap into the specialists. So in that example, we worked with Laurie Hagee at the South Australian Herbarium, who's a native Solanum specialist. And Laurie went on a very, very long road trip around Australia collecting um, native Solanum species not only to supply us with the plants for our experiments, but to improve knowledge of native Solanum, work with Aboriginal communities who value native Solanum, and uh, uh, lodge specimens in the herbarium. Um, there are also some very important crop plants often that are closely related to our weeds. So in the Solanum example, we're looking at not only eggplant, but potato and tomato. If you look at the potato example, there are thousands of different cultivars around the world. So which, one do you, which ones do you test? You can't test all of them. And so we developed a framework where we can select the, the most critical cultivars to test um, and still you know, make it feasible to, to do the experiments and, and produce some results. And all of this information, all the results go into a biocontrol agent risk assessment. It's the same process that um, the Commonwealth runs for new imports and so it's called the biosecurity import risk assessment. It's a very rigorous process. Um, there's a very high bar set in Australia. It's considered probably the most risk averse process for all biocontrol countries um, but we do manage to get biocontrol agents through um, and there's certainly um, in this case a lot of input along the way. 
So all of these risk assessments have input from stakeholders in each state, so state government agencies, um, conservation groups, and also the general public can have their say on any, any submissions. So once we've got through that entire process and we have some biocontrol agent release uh, to biocontrol agents to to release, we need to assess them. In the case of BlackBerry, um, you may be aware that uh, many years ago there was a, a rust fungus introduced that hasn't had the impact that we would like to see, even though it was an accidental introduction. But um, we've recently gone back and re-looked at the BlackBerry biocontrol program. Uh, the reason I mentioned Jackie is because she's currently working on that project and she's been to France and collected a, a sawfly which is uh, quite promising. She's imported it into quarantine so we have that insect in the quarantine lab out at Bandura and Jackie will initiate um, tests of uh, native rubus species that we mentioned earlier and important rubus cult cultivars that are grown for crops. She'll test that insect against those plants and also against the, the wild blackberry at the same time, we're planning open field experiments in France where we can do the, some of the more natural conditions and test uh, sawfly against um, blackberry and some of the rubus cultivars. Some, uh, sometimes we don't get good classical biocontrol agents, so uh, sometimes we do these native range surveys and we can't find a suitable candidate because there's nothing damaging or speci specific enough. In the case of serrated tussock, it's been really hard to find a, a classical biocontrol agent that we can import and use. Um, so some of the work that Raylene Kwong and others in New Zealand have been doing is looking at what's occurring in Australia and New Zealand already and causing dieback of serrated tussock. And they've come a long way in identifying some of the key um, pathogens associated with this, with, with this particular dieback. Um, at the moment, it kind of stalled during COVID, but at the moment, New Zealand does, has identified a fungus that may be suitable as a mycoherbicide. Um, that is a corticoid fungus, not cordyceps, that's really important, but a corticoid fungus. And that was collected in Argentina, but stalled, but they found another one in, uh, I think it's in New Zealand, where they're we're going to produce a bioherbicide. And that brings me to biocontrol of gorse, which is one of my pet projects um, and something I've wor been working on for several years. And biocontrol of gorse is very much at the end of the pipeline where we have biocontrol agents that have been approved and released, some of which have been out in the field for quite a while and some of which are very new. And it's this um, end of the pipeline work that we um, really work closely with land care groups and Parks Victoria and others. Um, the most recent biocontrol agent is called the soft shoot moth. Um, it attacks the, the shoots of uh, gorse, which would otherwise go on to form flowers and fruit, so it prevents that reproduction. It's really promising, um, and it's doing a lot of damage in Tasmania at the moment. It's really important to engage with the weed managers because we already know that scientists, farmers, public land managers, and community groups working together can conduct many more, more biocontrol agent releases than a lone scientist could. Um, so I could conduct 10 releases of this, this agent and wait 30 years for it to spread, or I could work with on-ground weed managers and conduct hundreds of releases and bring forward those benefits, possibly by decades. It also ensures that biocontrol is integrated with local and regional weed management planning, and that's critical. It's not simply a, f a matter of me going out and releasing biocontrol agents. It really needs to be part of an integrated program. And this is an example of how easy it can be sometimes once you have biocontrol agents to work with to collect them from uh, locations where they're established and abundant, harvest them and take them to new lo locations. In this case, um, gorse soft shoot moth established quite readily in Tasmania because Tasmania is really, it has some beautiful gorse, it's really lush, it's everywhere. <laughs> um, and our biocontrol agents really seem to enjoy feeding on it. Ours is kind of hard and gnarly sometimes. So we can go to Tasmania, collect those biocontrol agents that have established and bring them back to Victoria, even though we did the original work in Victoria. And that's Raylene Kwong, who's one of the co-authors of this presentation, um, very happily taking some of those moths back to Kilmore. But it's not just left to scientists um, in no way, shape or form. So biocontrol agent lends itself, uh, biocontrol lends itself to on-ground uh, networks. In this example, um, uh, DECA, as we're now called, um, 
works really closely in the Central Highlands Eden area with other land managers and has coordinated collections of gorse offshoot moth from Tasmania and conducted their own releases um, up around Lake Mountain, those sorts of areas. And they've also, uh, this kind of a, a, quite a, a neat trick where they're putting up tents at the moment. So that's Sally Lamborn who coordinate, coordinates that pro program. So Sally has erected tents and released the biocontrol agents into those tents um, to try and contain them so they can breed before the tents are removed. And she's comparing that to sites where we don't use tents, so less resource intensive, but possibly um, could fail. So we can record all of that information and years later go back to those release sites and see what worked and what didn't and, and hopefully learn from that and then inform other community groups who want to do something similar. Likewise, land care networks, they don't really need us after a while. Um, a land care group in Beechworth who records establishment of a biocontrol agent in that area um, can harvest agents and send them to other land care groups. And that's what happened here. So Trevor is the um, land care coordinator up around Beechworth and we're recording um, an observation of a broom gall mite that's established quite readily there. Fiona's a, a grazier in Omeo and she um, received broom gall mites from Beechworth and released them onto her property in a gully where she's really struggled to control broom for many years. But what's critical is that we capture all of that information and share it and that's been a key gap um, up until now. And we can do that through um, platforms such as the Atlas of Living Australia. And we talked about the Atlas of Living Australia earlier and the importance of databases and recording data. And the Atlas of Living Australia has a really nice um, feature called BioCollect. It's a, a citizen science platform linked to the Atlas. And through BioCollect, you can create your own projects. And we've done that for Weed Biocontrol. Uh, we call it the Biocontrol Hub, but essentially what it is, it's a, um, an interface where you can enter Biocontrol Observa agent observations from the field um, and it gets fed into the Atlas of Living Australia so it's shared so other people can benefit from that knowledge. Um, it's useful not only for weed managers but also, also for scientists so we can um, set up our releases as experiments. We may not come back in 10 years to see what happened but somebody will and they can relate their observations in 10 years time to the original release conditions. Um, it has a lot of potential. It's really um, an under-resourced concept at the moment, but it's already been taken up by a lot of weed managers because um, they can see the value of it, essentially, and you can have a, an app attached to it, and we've trialled the app. It works really well. You can record observations in the field, upload it. It's shared with other people, and they can benefit from your information. You can bring up distribution maps of the weed and the biocontrol agent, for example, and you can even submit your um, photo reference point, photo point reference Im images and it's, it's stored securely for somebody to come back and look at in 20 years time. Um, I should mention that this is, um, has been under resourced but we're currently working with the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions and the ALA to develop an investment plan to fully fund and roll this out over the next few years so that's an exciting recent development. And there are other ways that weed managers can get involved, for example the task forces, the VBT, the Victorian Gorse Task Force have really good resources on their website. Um, because the Gorse Biocontrol Program is quite advanced, um, the Victorian Gorse Task Force has some really good biocontrol information. There's also some good publications online such as the New South Wales DPI Manual and one available from SARDI. They're practitioner's guides, so they give you information about what to look for in the field, how to collect biocontrol agents and how to conduct your own releases and integrate them into the other things you're doing. And I welcome questions, and so does Jackie. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, open to any questions. Yep, in the middle. Thanks. The, uh, the moth that affects the, um, uh, the gorse, does that kill the gorse, or is it just weaken it, or does it... What's the effect? It, it attacks the shoots, but what does it actually do to that? So, possibly yes and yes. So, firstly, um, does it kill the plants? Not, not necessarily. It, um, it reduces reproduction, so it feeds on the soft shoots, so it prevents uh, flowering. Um, so, that reduces reproduction. So, it has a long term effect. But what we've noticed in Tasmania is that plants that have been attacked by gorse soft shoot moth, moth are dying for other reasons. 
and John Arison down in Tassie is doing some initial work. He thinks it's um, creating an opening for pathogens that are already present in the environment. So they're entering the plant through these feeding wounds and it's hastening the death of some plants. And so that'll be a really interesting area of future study, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, um, on with VBT, but also with the Yarram Yarram Land Care Network. There's a patch of gorse that we're interested in eradicating, about eight acres of solid gorse. Are you interested? It's public land, I think. <laughs> um, if you're eradicating it, probably not. I wouldn't be interested. But if, um, yes, I'm always on the lookout for good biocontrol agent release sites. Usually, uh, when I get an inquiry such as yours, um, we would go through um, what makes a good what makes for a good biocontrol agent release site and would it be suitable for what you're aiming to do? Often the answer is no. Um, you, uh, other control me measures may be more suitable, but often um, we'll decide that yes. It seems like um, other methods are constrained. This might be suitable for biocontrol and we have biocontrol agents and we can assist you. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you, uh, Greg. And look, that's, it, you've half answered the question I raised initially. Um, during the people raising at lunchtime, which is how you can be involved. So we'll come back to that at, after the end of the last speaker. Thank you. Now, our final speaker today is uh, Colin Arnold from Grazeway. And uh, Colin's the owner of Grazeway, a business started to better manage invasive weeds with goats and started in 2007, I understand, to control problematic vegetation without the use of herbicides, a creative uh, response. As well as working with Grazeway, Colin's uh, got 40 years experience as a horticulturist, working as a nurseryman, provide tube stock for the bush regen industry. Great knowledge of indigenous plants, which is important, the habitats they grow in, and also the weeds, the compromise those. So Grazeway's Grazeway is presently working with uh, uh, many organisations, they're listed there on your, your program, but Melbourne Water, uh, Cities of Knox, Whitehorse Casey, Parks Victoria, Landcare, and three universities, Monash, La Trobe and Deakin, as well as private land managers. So a great way to finish up today. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Okay. The irony is not lost on me to be presenting uh, talk about goats on an invasive species day. But... Uh, and many people have uh, queried why I do what I do. But, uh, but my background has taught me that... Uh, we really do have uh, difficulties controlling a lot of invasive weeds, uh, a lot of invasive species. So this talk's going to be mainly about photos. I'll obviously talk, but, uh, but we have many, 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 many weeds. A lot of them are berry-producing weeds. So ivy is a problematic weed, not so much in rural Australia, perhaps, but certainly a problem and keeps me well employed with goats. Uh, ivy's a real problem, ground cover, kills mature trees, kills a lot of native eucalypts. So it's a real problem. Um, but there are many weeds. This is a garden escapee. This is jasmine. Now, jasmine's probably not noted as an environmental weed, but it's coming. We have a lot of sleeper weeds, weeds that have been around for a long time and we haven't really focused on them. This is really emerging now as a major weed. It can proliferate over uh, quite extensive areas of vegetation. And it's really, really, it's probably not hard to kill with herbicide, but it's a problem. And uh, uh, gorse, we touched on gorse, one of our other speakers, and, uh, and gorse is a problem, a real problem along our freeways and uh, in a lot of urban areas. Uh, there's a couple of very big 80 kilo goats behind that gorse and you can't really see them. We get into areas with gorse that's very, very thick. And of course, gorse produces a seed that's viable for 25 years in the soil. So it's a problem not only as a plant, but in its ability to produce massive amounts of seed and to have them um, there in the environment active, potentially active for a long, long time. Okay, so this is what goats do to gorse. They completely strip it. And that's what goats tend to do on all weeds. They strip them of foliage, so they weaken the plant. So they may kill it, they may not kill it, but they weaken it so that, just as we just heard, sometimes it's another factor that might push that plant to, uh, uh, to die. Um, so, and what often happens in a situation like this is you'll, you'll expose the soil because all the foliage is gone, you get a mass germination. Um, 
and that can be with gorse, that can be with broom, that can be with ivy, all sorts of plants. So when you get a plant or a situation like this, this is a, a job that we did for Melbourne Water on the Dandenong Creek. So you've got Calisthesia and Phragmites. Phragmites is the reed that's been covered with this plant called Calisthesia. Arguably, uh, well, the, the Phragmites is native, important wetland species, uh, but out of control in many, many locations. And I'll talk about Phragmites in a little bit more detail, but, but if you put me in the middle of that, you wouldn't see me, and if you put someone on my shoulders, you might just see their head. That's how tall, it's about eight foot tall. So how do you deal with it? You put goats in there and they'll completely get through the whole lot. They can walk through the most impenetrable wall of vegetation and uh, take it back to what I tend to call grass. They just take things back to grass. Wandering trad, that's knee high wandering trad. Uh, uh, we spray that traditionally with things like star rain, um, really, really along waterways. This is right along the Dandenong Creek, really problematic. Nothing else can grow other than what's already been growing, those mature melaleucas, but nothing else can grow. So blackberries, ah, we're here to talk about blackberries a little bit. So goats love blackberries, okay? The only thing they love more than blackberries are roses, because that's like blackberries with ice cream sprinkled across the top. But they love blackberries, and they'll get into a wall of blackberries like that and they'll completely march right through it. And the thorns don't bother them, they just strip them of foliage and eventually we end up with that, that site there. That was the site that was covered with blackberries. And so uh, we, can, we can do incredible control of blackberries over, uh, well, as long a period as we can. Usually if you strip blackberries back through a growing season, so spring, summer, autumn, you get into winter, a lot of your blackberries will have died. If they haven't died, a second growing season will finish them off. So you get blackberries like this. This is a job we've done for land care. Uh, and uh, this is in Dixon's Creek. And it's about four hectares of blackberries there. Almost a complete cover, ground cover of blackberries. Uh, some mature trees, put goats in. And uh, that's what 40 goats, large dish goats, did in three months just under three months. So that's, that's, a, that's what you'd almost call an annihilation. Uh, now, those blackberries are not dead. We've pulled the goats off there. They will re-sprout and then there'll be a, a separate management uh, style put on that site. But, uh, but nevertheless, you can see the effect. This is a site in King Lake. Uh, this is right next to a berry farm. There was concern about the blackberries fruiting and producing um, fruit fly. So we had to put goats in there and it's very deep, steep gully covered in blackberries. Um, you can see the tree ferns were tall enough not to be affected. A lot of the ground floor, really all the ground story was blackberry. There was a little bit of fern uh, growth in there, but very difficult to work through. You couldn't put machinery in there. Um, very difficult. This, this shows you the waterway at the bottom of that gully. So there are no hoof marks. There's no detriment to that bank. People talk about you can't use goats, hard-hoofed animal, spread seeds, all those sort of typical questions. Hard-hoofed animal, yes, they are a hard-hoofed animal. Uh, but uh, on waterways, they tend to not like to go into the water. They avoid the water. Don't even like mud. They're real princesses, actually. They don't like mud. So they'll avoid it. They'll reach in, but they won't. Uh... Here's another weed, honeysuckle. So we deal with many varieties of weeds. Honeysuckle is a, a rampant plant, uh, dominating a Phragmites, which is uh, no mean effort. Put goats in there and they'll take it back to that. What you can see there, there are humps in there. That's tree violet, native species, been completely covered, generally been killed by it. So I want to focus quickly on a, on a site. You can see... Right here, right in there, there's a patch of willow. This is, a, this is a, I think, about a three hectare site we did from Melbourne Water, pre-goats, haven't put goats on there yet. You can see the willow patch. We've got that site there is dominated by blackberries, phragmites and honeysuckle. So under those willows that I pointed out, are, uh, is under the willows you've only got trad. So they're the two species, willows and trad. So we put goats in there um, 
And uh, this is that site after the goats have been in there. Now, they were in there permanently for, for, th for two and a half years. This is 12 months in. They'd stripped it right down, stripped out all the honeysuckle, all the blackberries, all the trads, all the weeds. Uh, grass was starting to grow. It looks pretty bare there, but that's the height of summer. But you can see that patch... willows we've cut them down and when you cut them down normally in region you cut and paint we don't cut and paint we cut we fell the trees goats come in they eat the foliage they ring bark the olives uh, uh, the olives the willows they love olives they ring bark olives too um, and so and then we pile that up you can see the little bit of bare ground there's a little bit of tread at the base of these trees but basically the tread's been grazed out and just with goats on site full time, that's what we ended up with. So that's a dramatic change. No herbicide, no people other than me cutting down willows to give them access, give the goats the access. And so we've got persicari, we've got junkers, we've got carricks coming up where it was only trad. That's a good result. So this is a look at the willows before goats were put in, okay, so you can see from another angle, see how big they were, you can see the effect, okay, and that's just how that site has progressed. Um, now, I mentioned Phragmites. Phragmites is a native plant, very important native plant, great plant, great for wildlife, great for bird life, but Phragmites can dominate. And in this situation, it's dominated. This is along a freeway uh, in Melbourne, out near Dandenong, and uh, you can see the mow lines. You can see where they've mown it in the dry period, but they can't mow it anymore because it's a bit too wet. So, but in the foreground, or in that middle section, you can see a much greater diversity of plant life, wetland plants that should be there. That's a better shot of it to give you an idea of the, uh, a more diverse wetland. But under that Phragmites in the background, there'll be none of that. This is how they treat Phragmites in America, around the Great Lakes, okay? Massive, massive problem. And so they burn it. But goats love Phragmites. They eat it. Phragmites is a grass, a bit like bamboo. It's just another form of grass. So this photo shows you, again, this side that we've sort of focused on a little bit in the foreground blackberries. Just behind the blackberries, there's gorse. Behind the gorse is Phragmites, and in amongst the Phragmites is honeysuckle running up the trees. Okay, so can't even get on site. So hard to even walk on it. We can't walk on it. So um, we had a fence put up. We have to contain goats. We put a fence up. Site was groomed so we could put a fence up. The creek itself is a natural barrier, so they can't cross the creek. And we put goats in there, and this is just after the goats have been in for a while. That's what they did to the Phragmites. You can see how it looks like it's been brush cut, but that literally stops at the water line because they don't want to go into the water. And if you look at the, right at the base of the Phragmites, there's nothing in that water. It's just bare water and Phragmites. Okay. There's another look at it about 12 months later. So, again, that was the original shot pre-goats. That's what... The goats did so they took out the gorse they took out the blackberries they've taken out all the honeysuckle they can reach and they've taken out the phragmites but they've taken it back to the water which is its proper habitat or the water's edge okay now i haven't got photos included in this but as that site progressed more and more stuff grew and it was a great result so there are tree weeds there are climber weeds there are bulb weeds there's so many weeds there's also water weeds or plants that are invasive I talked about Phragmites. So this is a wetland. So on one side of the fence, on the right-hand side, that's really bulked up, very thick, very, very limited range of plants growing in there. On the left, much more open, open waterway, much better habitat, much greater diversity, I should say, greater diversity of indigenous plants. And that's because we put goats in there. It dried out in summer. It's an ephemeral wetland. So it's not a permanent wetland, an ephemeral wetland. It dries out, they get in, they graze it. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, no, oh, no, the client's not going to be happy. But what happened was they improved the quality because they grazed the plant. They opened it up. They got on top of bulrushes and 
uh, Eleocaris and some of these plants that really dominate. And so now we've got crassula and all sorts of other things growing in the water, open water, herons can wade in that water, the clarity of water is better, everything is better, no herbicide, no people, just managed, and I emphasise managed, grazing with goats. So, okay, so big weeds, okay, we all know big weeds, so this is, this is a common weed, but this is uh, nutgrass, uh, a lot of regen people spray it, they have to use, uh, uh, they have to, it produces massive amounts of seed, it can really bulk up, can take over a, a landscape, quite problematic. Goats love to eat it and they will eat it enthusiastically and when it's in amongst things like powers, right, we can put goats in there and quite literally, people don't believe me when I tell them this, but this is what goats do in amongst native grasses. Not all native grasses, some native grasses goats will eat, but that's Poa ensiformis, Lamandra, Garnia. There's a number of sedges and, and juncuses and things that goats will largely leave in preference for weeds. So that's a management tool. We take advantage of it. So when we've cleaned up a site, we plant tube stock in weedy grass, just plain weedy grass. And we use little goats. We get the big goats out. We use little goats. They graze it. As the plants get bigger, the goats get a bit bigger. They still focus on the weeds, and this is what we end up with, right? So that is, that is a totally managed landscape with goats, other than people planting tube stock. And uh, so some people say to me, look, goats aren't the silver bullet, and I agree, uh, but I think it might be a silver-plated bullet in some situations. Not every situation, but in some situations. So that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, that's a, a brave and uh, really interesting talk. It's, um, any, any questions? Yeah, I thought there might be a couple. Uh, perhaps over someone who hasn't asked. Me first? Oh. Yeah, yeah, please. Wherever I'm just you. curious, thanks for the talk. Um, curious how the, what your observations have been, how goats interact with native wildlife or any species that you interact with in season? Um, well, I've never noticed any issue. Um, uh, I've, we, we've had sites where there have been kangaroos, wallabies, uh, echidnas, um, and it's never been an issue. I've never seen any adverse or uh, reaction. The, on, the, only, the only animal they react to, really, uh, is um, uh, dogs, but a lot of kookaburra, a lot of lot of uh, uh, lot of predatory bird activity with the goats because goats walk through and they open it up, so they open up the landscape. So whereas skinks and things could find cover, they're less likely to be able to find cover. Uh, but so 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 it's 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 a positive interaction. And and by my last photo, you can see we do create cover. We create we we devastate we. Uh, that's not the right word to use. <laughs> we can strip a, a site back and expose a lot of wildlife, but it's all about management. So if we want to not do that, we can, we can slow it right down. We cannot have 40 goats, we can have 10 goats. We can slow it right down. We can use little goats instead of big goats. So, so no, I haven't seen any adverse effect, but, I, but again, that'll be about management, but no, no bad reactions. So. Okay. Uh, maybe you, oh, yeah, over the microphone now. Yeah, just a question from me. Have you exper uh, experimented on trying to control the palatability of certain goats using different species from different continents to try and target so different say, varieties of goats in a landscape or something like that? No, no, and and and, and I've used angora goats and boar goats and ca uh, and um, uh, cashmere goats and uh, and and I think they all they all look at a blackberry in the same way. They all look at juncus in the same way. I don't think there's any difference. What I am interested in, and I know all our researchers, and I, look, it's been a great day and I've really enjoyed all the speakers, so thank you very much to everybody, but I'd love someone to research why goats walk up to some plants and smell it. It's not poisonous, it's palatable. I'll smell it and I'll walk away. And I'd love to know what's in that plant. What, is it an alkaloid? What is it? What is it that makes that plant that go, go, no, I'm not interested in eating you. Uh, and there are native plants they won't touch, and there are other native plants that they, 
So, so yeah. Over here, thanks. Yeah, great presentation. Um, Tasmania have got Fonzie the dog that sniffs out serrated tussock. That's great. They're trying to get another dog in Victoria. But just um, looking at the power and the native stuff there, would the goats be smart enough to leave the native powers and eat the serrated tussock? <laughs> or would it eat the lot? Or does well, it eat serrated? I, I, I don't think it's question. about intellect. Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's about, again, serrated tussock, we haven't had them on serrated tussock. But my suspicion is that serrated tussock is probably one they wouldn't eat. Because serrated tussock and Chilean needlegrass are probably very similar to Stiper, right? And I've got some terrific, couldn't show you a thousand photos that I would have loved to show today of a site where they've completely taken the any grass, all the air harder, all the weedy grasses right down, and there's Stiper, which is very close to Chilean needlegrass, sitting proud, full of seed, right? So, so what is it about that plant? Again, this is what we. We'd love to know what is it in that plant that they they sniff and they, they say no. So which, I don't know. which potentially you might be able to extract and spray on the plants exactly. you don't want to be eaten or exactly. something like that. Well, just, just ask in relation to if they eat blackberries, do they, they so what goes in one end, do seeds come out the other? <laughs> yeah, I get asked that a lot. Um, I've, I've given talks where people have said no, goats, their d digestive system completely destroys the seed. Uh, I tend to say, I don't know if that's true, but let's just say it is true, uh, sorry, let's just say it's not true and that the seed passes quite through their system without any problems. If you, if, see, once you start managing a site, um, if you stop managing it with whatever method, whether it's herbicide people, slashing, goats, doesn't matter, once you stop, the weeds will come back. So you've got to continue, you've got to have a program and if, and if goats are eating seed, that's viable through their system and coming back out and germinating, but they're on there for long enough, they'll, they'll manage that plant. And the trick is not what goats eat. So I say to people all the time, I say to people at Parks Vic, because I work with Parks Vic, don't worry about the weeds. We'll handle the weeds. It's what they don't eat that's the most interesting, that's the most uh, challenging, because if we, can, if, we can, if we can go back to that image and do that and get good crank cover. We know that healthy bush resists weed infestation. So we've got to get it back to be healthy. It's all about the soil, the microbes, very, very, very big subject, very complex subject. Uh, but so I don't worry about the seeds, whether they're viable or not through the system, through the gut. One last question about goats. Yep, middle there. Yeah, thanks again for the presentation. <coughs> I um, work for a, a Shire Council in the northeast of Victoria, and we're just about to put out an RFQ for roadside grazing. Um, would, some of the councillors want to use sheep, and I've been advised that sheep don't have much road sense. Can um, can goats be contained in that sort of environment with temporary fencing? Is that something that is feasible? Well, we, or? I, through lunch, I showed a video. Um, I just had it put on. I can run it again. If we finish, if, if, if people want to watch it, but but there's temporary fencing that contain goats into a site, and uh, and uh, and we 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 want people to, we want people to buy that. We want the CFA to buy it so that we can put goats in to reduce fuel load. We want councils to buy it so that and make it available to private residents so they can contain uh, their own animals or hired animals because I hire goats. I'll just put a plug in there. Um, so that uh, so that they can manage fuel load, weed load, road reserves, all those sorts of things. So councils can do it too, and and we do a lot of work with community groups where communities get either get a, get a grant and buy the fence or borrow it or hire it. Uh, the Northern Yarra Weed Group uh, a borrowed fi uh, a bought sorry fencing through Melbourne Water to put up. Uh, to sorry, oh, thanks, Rob. Okay, so. So temporary fencing is available to be hired or bought or whatever to contain animals in almost any situation. And one of those, some of those photos, the, the fencing goes up land like that. And we put it up through blackberries. You can cut a path through it, but we actually put it up through blackberries. So community group volunteers come together, they put it up, so it empowers communities to deal with the problem. Very okay. good, thanks. Okay, I was gonna halt there. Is Ewan, is it gonna change the conversation? Yeah, yeah, go. Uh, 
Um, yeah, look, virtual fencing might be a possibility. That I, most of my work is done in Melbourne, in and around Melbourne. Yeah, so, so I can see the possibility that the, the problem is always um, not so much the goats escaping or running away. Uh, the problem is dogs coming onto site. And so dogs won't recognise or won't... won't res <laughs> there's no fence there. So, so this, this solution is not, not without its... I mean, like, you guys are talking about the research you've been doing and the years of research ahead of you. Well, I, I say to people, if I know... If the subject of using goats for weekend drives is this big, and I probably know more about it than anyone else because I've been doing it for 20 years... I only know that much, yeah. so we got a lot to learn. But but virtual fencing is possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you to the two speakers this afternoon. <laughs> now, what we're going to do now, before you have a, a break and a and a more informal chat, is just open up to a bit of a discussion. But first of all, let let me just remind you. So we and I'm not going to try and. Uh, so talk about each uh, talk in detail. You've, you've been here and you've heard them, but we started the day listening to uh, you and talk about integration, about nuance, about the fact that everything intersects with everything else. I think that's become apparent through the day. We moved on to uh, Shalom with biosecurity, uh, prevention, citizen science, and uh, you know try to stop things getting in in the first place, of course. And Elise talking about detection and deterrence, and uh, tiger urine, and I've got in brackets here, which um, is a deterrent, obviously. Uh, Stephen, uh, looking for that silver bullet, uh, genetic biocontrol, and then we, we heard a bit, of course, about genetics and how that's going to help us deal with some of these problems, both now and in the future, so looking for ways to uh, improve upon what we do now. Uh, a couple of comments from Alex about weeds being super pioneers um, modelling and predicting, which we saw a lot of, which was really helped me actually understand, just, just seeing those little dots move around, I thought it was very exciting, so I'm easily amused. But it was great, to, and I, I love the fact that, you know, you sort of reset it slightly and if it heads off in a different way, it just reminds us that these things, in theory, can look fantastic and they just take a little bit of resetting and off they go. Also, a, a push for taxonomy, which I thought was important. Uh, then Ben talking about gene drives, which we've heard a, a bit about, uh, and, make, and comparing them to cane toes, just saying we do have to be, be careful. Um, generation times, um, being careful in developing technology and using thresholds, you you'll recall, as a way of controlling that technology. And that really interesting point I thought about social licence. And decide, these things might sound scary, they might sound like they've got big impacts, but uh, so do a lot of the things we do now. And that's what we have to, I think, continually keep in mind. Uh, moving through to Greg talking about risk assessments and, and uh, again, risk is what it's all about. Is it what's the benefit against the cost and that's what has to be weighed up with just about everything, well, everything we, we do. Again, a bit more taxonomy, which was, was nice to hear. And then we started here too in that talk about uh, the role of community and government groups in monitoring and releases. So I, I'd like to kind of return to that a bit if we can. And then, of course, we've had our assumptions tested a bit in that last talk by Colin, uh, using an invasive species to control other invasives. And, uh, but, but also, um, sort of going back really to you and starting the day with looking at creative and integrated approaches to management of weeds. It's not just kind of one thing that's going to work. Let's look at a bunch of solutions. So with that, I thought I'd, I, I would open up to broader questions and maybe particularly focusing on what as a community, we can do too, and, and the speakers as well can respond to that or even raise them themselves. Um, we've heard about monitoring, we've heard about actually helping with delivery of things. Are there other, other particular things where the community might be able to help or other, thi other things you'd like to get involved with? So let me just open up broadly to start with. Yeah, please, in the middle. <laughs> Therefore, is uh, almost an obligation on new people, eyeballing a few of them, to get out there amongst us and, and spread the word like you did today. Uh, the more people who understand more, um, and having been a science teacher in my early days, we've, in many ways we failed, because the populace doesn't even get it after COVID. So, 
you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on that, you know, you've got to start at the edges and keep pecking away. More yep. and more people need to know more and more of this stuff. Yeah, and, ma and decision makers as well as people going to going to do things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, okay, by so. Uh, I just wonder, just before we get to the next question, whether anyone who's spoken today feels there's any ideas how we do that. I mean, the thing with a session like today is that most people in the room are keen to learn and keen, you know, want to be here, <laughs> which is always a trouble when you're, you're talking to the community. How do you get out there more broadly and get to people? Yeah, and go, Colin. Yeah, can I, oh, I do you want to add like to that? Yeah, yeah, please. Can I add on to that one? I'm thinking, I'm thinking more. It may be even need to be more broader, as from community up and starting conversations, because the speakers here today have obviously are, are doing great work, and it's really great for for what we've learnt, but. If we ask them to do more of this, they're going to be doing less of what they're doing. And so maybe as a community, and, and, and it's always, you know, most of the people here, well, I'm, I'm just making the assumption that most of us here have got a vested interest and have been involved and could probably um, be considered a bit of a leaders within the community but it's actually now trying to fill that gap between us and them in somehow we need to possibly I don't know advocate mm. somewhere and that's obviously money mm. it needs continuity which I think in my community we always lose we always get someone good something happens and then the continuity is gone or the leader within the community um, is no longer there for a whole heap of reasons. I think that's that's where I think we've... That's I don't the know. That's the missing chunk, yeah. Yeah, that's um, something that needs a conversation. I think. Colin, you and then we'll go to the back, sorry. Yeah, yeah I, I had a, um, a student came to me about a year ago who was studying environmental science in Canberra approached me yesterday and said, look, I'm back in back in Victoria, central Victoria, I want to do what you do, just letting you know. And, and I said, that's great. So he's a young person, he's in early 20s, wanting to do what I do. But I've also been approached by some secondary schools and they've got problem with vegetation. And I've said, we can, we can come on and we can manage that vegetation for you. We can do it in an ongoing way. But you can make that environmental study part of your curriculum so that young people learn at school how they can manage their, their school environment uh, that's out of control. And so I think they're the sorts of things that you were touching on that I think we can do. Thank you, Colin. Ewan? Yeah, I think the, one of the biggest problems, at least for academics that I know and researchers, is it's outreach and science communication in general is typically not at all recognised in workload and reward structures. So I get a pat on the back for grants, for teaching, uh, and not a lot else. Papers published, right? Um, most of the science communication I do and my colleagues do, they do because we're passionate about it and we think it matters. It's actually not formally recognised at all in our workload models. So until workload structures change and reward structures change, there'll be a minority of people that do it. Because, yeah, it is literally what you said. It's like, well, when do I do my other things? You know, how, do I, how do I balance those? I would actually love to do more of this than sitting down and trying to publish papers in journals that no one reads. Um, so, but that's not the reward structure. So, It's a good point. Thanks. Thanks, you. And at the back, yeah. Um, just a, a, this has been fantastic. Um, as a lapsed biotechnologist, this has been, you know... <laughs> Uh, extremely interesting, and uh, I haven't done this type of work for a very long time. And I do some work with land care at the moment. Um, one of the biggest barriers that I find with some landowners is they don't like chemicals, they don't like bullets, uh, they, some of them don't care about fencing, is, is to how to convince them to control weeds, control pest animals. Now, if I was to go and say, look, we've got this great bio gene technology, that'll even scare them more. Uh, there is a lot of scepticism about that end of science. And, you know, I've faced it for a very long time working in the dairy industry. You know, as soon as you mention GMOs, people run away. So how do we get past that and make it more accessible to the skeptics in 
in the rural landscape. Maybe one of the speakers who was talking on that. Anyone willing to give us a... Oh, I'll just take a comment, a comment over here. Yep. Yep. Um, our Serrata Tussock Working Party travel the state and go to field days and agricultural shows as part of a education program for Victorians and sometimes from interstate. And we're getting some more signs put up around the state. The, the, I suppose the questions we get asked is what does it look like, those that don't know it, and we compare it with a sample in a box without seeds and a perspex box with a cover. And then if I've got it, how do I control it and what do I do about it? I dare say the Seymour show next month will be questions about the price of propofenate and its price since it's gone back on the market. It's massively higher than it was pre-COVID. Chinese factories burnt down. So, um, but I think the, the thing that comes up time and time again is compliance. And I know Nigel, and I know there's a few AGVIC people in the room, but we get the questions about why isn't there more compliance on the management of the weeds on your property? So no answers here today, I know, but it's just something that comes up time and time again. Identification, how to manage it, and why isn't the government doing something about it? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, we won't, I won't sort of give you, as you say, there's no answer to that question. Um, in the, the Taylor Swift seat behind the, behind the there. post. <laughs> <laughs> I have a slightly different concern, and, and it's today I've heard fantastic things, really wonderful things. But how does Frida Smith find those things? I think one of the problems we've got is that people do want to know about stuff, then they may know to go to the Department of Ag, or they may know to go here or there, but they don't really have a... I don't think, and I might be wrong, I hope I'm wrong, I don't think that we've organised the literature that is actually available out there about all of these things. I'm really concerned that um, we need a sort of a, a library facility so that you can put there that there's this fantastic article about goats and it'll make you like goats and there's another one that'll make you hate goats and one will do this and that. Um, we need a little bit of commentary and a sort of cataloguing of all of this information because people who want it can't find it. I think there's seven million things on Google if you ask for stuff about control of rabbits. How do you know which one to use? Thank you. I'll, Lynn, do you want to jump in or do you want to... Yep. Yeah, oh, are you wanting to finish up or you wanted to ask a question? No, no, I just want to... <laughs> please, please go. go. Um, I guess we've got lots of network um, represented here and community networks are, are very powerful and can achieve a lot in their areas. So the VBT has partnership groups presently or in the past all over the state. It would be very easy to mobilise that those people. Um, for instance, I was speaking to Alexander uh, in the break. Now, they need the genetic to, to know the diversity of blackberries because there's lots of different species. So, if they had the resources to process samples, that would be an easy task. But to, to enable that work um, to go forward, um, they, they need um, funding before it's any use doing anything about collecting that at a community level. So I guess we've all got a role. We all have local MPs. We have... Um, we, we've got to find ways to communicate to government where the funding's going to come from unless there's private, you know, and, and not, there's not much in the way of private um, sponsorship for things like this. So um, I can't see... We'll, we'll all be spinning our wheels, um, as we have been doing for, for the last 20 years, because you get 
rid of some blackberry, but then there's plenty more over there to take its place. And when you have a um, have a have bushfires like I'm I'm in the middle of the Upper Murray, um, all the good work done up there over nearly 20 years is all gone in you know that couple of days when the fire went through, and all the seed bank germinated. So the 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 genetic, um, you know, the gene drive, it, it must make a difference because if, I, I know I'm not sure whether it stops the blackberry seeding or what happens, but it ha that's more of a, a sustainable long-term solution than anything we're doing now. Yeah. Thanks. Alex, do you want to jump in? Yeah. And then we will go to the back right. Yeah. Um, as as a, a gene drive modeler, uh, but also a person with a bit of common sense, you know that uh, you're going to kill the blackberry, but something else will take over. And that's, that's great. That's about the diversity of the systems. There's no point uh, going for a silver bullet because there's no silver enemy. That's not the point. The point is create a resilient system by active management. So there's one key feature that is you don't want to leave a niche empty. If you empty something and leave it, Turn your back, come back, it's going to be invaded. It's, you've all witnessed that. There's no point doing that. Um, and the issue is uh, the, the, the weak time versus the political initiative time. So as far as I'm concerned, initiative time is five years, but my weeds, they have a bit more time than that. They can wait for five years before they take over again. Um, we do need a bit of a transversal initiative, so I personally work uh, with uh, the people from the Australian Herbicide Resistance Initiative, mostly in ragrass, uh, wild radish. Uh, they're heavily funded by the Grain Research and Development Council. Of course, there's vested interest. There's millions of dollars. They do have extension offices, a couple of them, uh, professional, full-time. Uh, they're using all the range of communication tools they have, so that comes from a newsletter, a website that is updated, an app that uh, pollutes you in spam, maybe. But occasionally, you're going to have an eye, and that's going to make a difference. Um, we need to find, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is for my lab because I'm the best, huh? Let, let's find Ben because he's much greater. You would just want to keep on having one model of sustainable funding and fire everybody, and that includes me, but keep the extension officer that actually puts together the newsletter every Monday to remind people that, you know what, you're going to deal with that paddock. <laughs> Thank you, Alex, for putting yourself out of a job. Uh, yeah, thank you. Back. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I've noticed is in common with a lot of the uh, issues that have been raised today is um, uh, needing people to care, um, whether it's academics and researchers in their own time doing work like this, communicating, whether it's uh, a land care community that's getting older and needs to be replenished, whether it's um, students. Uh, that care and have a custodial feel for the land. And so I think probably what's in common for all of us here is, is the children. Um, that new generation, that resource that's coming up to replace us, what can we do to bring about in their lives that custodial feel for the land? So I would just maybe when people are going home, have a think you know, what are the children or the younger generation in my life that what can I do to get them out into nature, get them exposed to um, the natural environment that's around them so that they can maybe, with a bit of luck, have that custodial attitude to the land. Thanks. Thank you. That, thank you very much. I was going to say that might be a, a, a nice point to finish, but no, we, let's have a bit more discussion. Just to follow up. Yeah, yeah, please. Just to follow up on, on what was just said then. Uh, years ago, I used to live in the Shire of Hume and they had a well, had an incentive program. If you got rid of your weeds, you got 25% off your rates. But on top of that, they actually had uh, courses. They had spray courses. They had field days. And I'd actually like to see that in a lot more councils. So I've gone from Hume to Kilmore and Kilmore has introduced now fines, but there's no, in, there's no incentive program. <laughs> the, their weed problem... Or in fact, my weed problem is their weed problem in that it yeah. comes off the roads onto my property. So I treat my mm. property, they don't treat theirs, and then it's back again. 
So I, I think if councils across the board, and a lot of councils do have weed departments, I, I think that should be you know, our first you know, port of call for advice and then referrals, if you like. Yeah. Um, uh, the Hume Council had a thing called a weed deck. They had about 20 or 30 different weeds, told you, you know, had pictures of it, told you how to treat it, and then you could ring them or you can ring the weed department for support. And I just think for you know, us day-to-day -day people, uh, if our council, because we all have council, we all pay rates, uh, I, I just think you know, if some of them were a bit more proactive, it would make our lives a bit easier. Thank you. And also for that point about information and the power of information, which is kind of a theme that's come through as well. The better informed we are, the better decisions we can make on all these issues. I might... For, um, formally close there. I, I didn't get. I, was, I had a provocation which I, someone raised with me during the day, which I was going to raise if things got a bit quiet. And that was when, when, when do you give up on an invasive and embrace it? Um, I won't need to raise that one, so that's good. <laughs> I think with a blackberry you wouldn't want to embrace it, but I think with some of these other ones, uh, it's an interesting question. I, I, I only put it in the, the mix because it's a. Uh, um, the way we deal with this over the next few decades and with climate change and with the, the changes in our environment, um, we, we have to be ready and open to discuss honestly and openly what we're doing. And I think that's come through today too, is that there are no, no silver bullets but lots of potential and if we can support that as a community and support that through funding and support that through governments and, and councils, we, we can achieve um, some great things. So. Thank you all very much. I'd like uh, Lynn Colson particularly, who's obviously been driven. Are the people you'd like to thank, Lynn, that I... Well, let me say, first of all, the Victorian Blackberry Task Force, the Victorian Government, which has supported this, and, and all the speakers today who've done, I think, fantastically. I've, I've loved it. Done really well. Is there anyone else I should thank, Lynn? I didn't get a list from you, so do you need to thank anyone from the, the team here, some the, the volunteers that have worked behind the scenes? <laughs> you can c come and give an, an Emmy speech or whatever it is, an <laughs> Oscar speech. Well, I think today has met, well, probably more than met our um, objective, which was to get some information out there, let people take it on board and work out how they can best use the information that we've got um, and for what purpose. And I guess the purpose is um, long term and, and people don't like long term things, neither does government. And so if you talk long term, <laughs> nobody wants to listen. But I think it, it is, it's so important um, with all the changes that we've seen in climate and the way that affects um, everything, bushfires, they have long-term impacts on, on the environment. And as I said before, that's very obvious. Quite a few of us are from the northeast, and um, the way that that you know, brought back blackberry weeds we haven't seen for years, um, initially reduced deer numbers, but now they're all back again and browsing the the new growth of, of, of plants. Um, and there are interventions like by Parks Victoria for um, deer control, which has helped a lot while, while the forest was able to be, you know, kind of open. Um, but you think they're all short, they're all short term solutions and they're not really solutions, are they? They're, they're management actions, I guess you could say, that, that maybe helps um, and on individual properties, that's fine because you can manage that. But when you think of the amount of public land um, that there is, um, that that is, and I'll talk about Blackberry again because that's what I know most about because I live in a Blackberry patch just about. Um, it's it's just how do you um, what what is the long term solution? We. Might, well, I might not be here to see that uh, going on the time frame, but it's sure, we need to start. And whoever said that, um, I think it might have been Ben, that was it? Or oh, whoever said the best time to plant a tree was 30 years is now, like was 30 years ago for now. Well, that's quite true. And so I hope everyone thinks about that and how 
um, your voice might be able to influence through whichever way, politically, has to be the first way, I suppose, um, that th these problems can be highlighted throughout the community, that, that climate change is having and will have more effects on populations of these things that we, we deal with every day. And so um, research and something that's more, you know, going might take a long time, but it will, it will help um, rather than our short-term management. So thank you all. Uh, it's been, uh, and especially thank you to Kim who stepped into this role at very short notice and has done a wonderful job. Thank you, Kim. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, the members of the Victorian Blackberry Task Force who have been spending quite a bit of time yesterday afternoon putting things in bags and bringing them here and making up name tags and doing all that on a, on a volunteer basis, which is, is wonderful. And a special thanks to Bart and Roberts, who is our Community Pest Management Officer and has just been fabulous getting all this, pulling all this together. So thank you to all the volunteers. And thank you.